Uh, I'm glad you made it. Side effects asked me to host this, so you'll have to endure me throughout the whole afternoon. I apologize for that. Um, but I want to uh, give you a menu, what we have here. A bunch of really, really nice people whose work I much admire. We'll start out with uh, two weirdos you might know, um, who try to do something a bit more experimental with you. Um, after that, we've got a studio showcase by the lovely Alexa and uh, Lucas from XK. And then we have Paul Estevez trying to show you the ultimate Houdini hack. I'm sure what that is. And we finish off with uh, Jakob Spacic, who talks a bit about his VFX craftsmanship. So please enjoy an afternoon with a bunch of humans I greatly admire. And let's directly dive into it. Um, yep. And let me have a forward to this one. So that guy here is Chris Hoffman and Moritz Schwind. And uh, we thought we'd try attacking this topic that everyone is talking about, AI. And um, we tried to attack it, from, to attack it from an angle. Attack. Attack. Mm. To tackle it, to yeah. work on it from an angle uh, that we haven't seen yet in any presentations. And um, please um, interrupt us. You can heckle us if uh, you yeah, don't please, disagree. Please uh, interrupt also with questions. Genau, exactly. So, <laughs> so what we're going to do here is uh, we try to demystify what is AI from a conceptual perspective. Um, what is the most popular image generation algorithm that is called AI today? How does it work? Under emphasis the is on trying also. Yeah, emphasis yeah. on trying, yeah, exactly, yeah. and maybe failing. Let's see about that. Um, and then showing you how we integrate and duct tape it into a pipeline that's already existing and that maybe some of you know a bit better with that. I'll hand it over the, to the very brave Chris Hoffman <laughs> to uh, part one of a Hitchhiker's Guide to Connecting Houdini to the Latent Space. Yeah. And I think you brought your own yeah. Python notebook. Exactly. So let me just... So, and I think we have to... Let me just switch monitors here. So let's duplicate this. There you okay. go. Okay. So, hello. I'm Chris. And usually, what I usually do... So I'm going a bit out of my uh, comf comfort zone today, because usually I do uh, images like these and animations. So I work with uh, Houdini and what, uh, yeah, all, every software I can get my hands on, basically. I, I, I like to explore uh, software in ways that you would usually probably not use it or misuse it or whatever you want to call it. But um, for, for today, this isn't really uh, that important. What I want to talk about today is um, oops, sorry, uh, machine learning or AI or whatever you want to call it. I mean, they're, they're, it's, it's a thing that uh, has been um, bubbling up quite, uh, uh, quite a lot at, uh, uh, in the last couple of weeks. So um, for me, this whole journey started like, I think, two years ago when these um, weird images surfaced uh, in the beginning of this whole journey uh, that now ends in almost photorealistic images. And I always uh, think if, if you look at the medium that the photorealistic image is basically already where the... the the medium, and you stop me when I go too much. No, no, no. I'm a tangent person. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop you before you tell yeah, us your okay. theory about raspberries. So, um, what I find interesting is when the medium is still uh, autonomous, where, where it has its own language, which um, with uh, photoreal images, they are photoreal, There's, you know, they are real, they, they just basically are what, what we see. So, there's not too much personality in there. So I'm always interested in emerging stuff where it doesn't really work yet, because I think it's very, it, it has a very unique uh, perspective um, through failing at what it sh should maybe do. And these, these uh, images, um, this one is a, a VQ GAN, and this one is a Big Sleep. So they, they were like... Um, basically open source projects that kind of um, brought together different uh, concepts um, or models. Um, I will talk about this uh, a bit later, but it, it, do, you, like, do you know about stable diffusion and this kind of stuff? How many of you have interacted with it? 
Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> okay, right. that's good. <laughs> so you know roughly what I'm talking about. So, so, but how many of you like dove deeper into it? Like, how does it actually work? In the oh, there's a, there's a few. That's good because that's exactly what I try to do. But um, I'm not coming from a developer background. I'm also not coming from a math background. I'm coming from a, a visual background. So. At first, for me, th this whole world is obviously, or was, or, or still is probably, uh, <laughs> because it's, it's very much a process. Uh, it's not that I fully understand this stuff, but for me, it's just interesting to find out how does this stuff actually work, because that's almost more fascinating to me than the actual images that come out at the end. And the more I learned about it, the more I, uh, I was, uh, fascinated by the whole process of it, by the concepts of it, and um, yeah, the structure of it, if you want, um, and not really what can it do for me in my pipeline or in my uh, way of working. That's obviously a, a little part of it, but um, it's more interesting to me how how this whole, uh, let's say, um, system for lack of a better word, system works. Uh, so I tried to um, dive into it because I was so curious that I thought, okay, all this math stuff, I kind of figure it out as I go, um, which is obviously quite hard uh, to do. But um, I read a lot about it, and just for the people that didn't dive into it uh, that deeply, what, what, how does... Uh, and a neural network work, or the, how do these uh, these models work? And if there's any uh, professionals in here, I'm sorry, it's probably <laughs> very low level, but it's just trying to get this uh, across from my perspective, from a person that doesn't come from that field and also uh, comes from a visual field that probably most of you also come from. Um, so if, if we imagine uh, a neural network like uh, a machine, for example, uh, that tries to map one concept to the other concept. For, for example, if, if you want an image to another image. So we want, we want to feed in an image into the machine and get out another image um, on the other end, a, a, a specific image, so, so to say. And how do we get the machine to spit out what we want on the other end, right? So. And it could be everything. It could be we feed uh, a text in and get an image out, or we feed an image in and get a text out, which is um, which both obviously has its uh, its uh, use. But the the main part is how do we translate an image to a to a text that fits the image, right? Um, and and the whole the the system and how it works. You have to imagine. You have like a machine with like a million sliders, and only if you if you kind of have a sli every slider in the right position, it kind of does what you want at the end. But it can approximate literally almost every problem you can imagine. So it is if you want, it is a a, a big function that kind of maps one thing to the other, right? And how does that work? How can we map? an image to a text or an image to another image. Um, how that works is basically, you, you, you have to imagine a, a loop, like we do something over and over again. And in that loop, we try to adjust the slider. So we start from a random position, and then we feed our input in, and we know what our output should be at the end. We feed it through the machine, and the first iteration, we get garbage. It doesn't work at all. It isn't similar at all. It is far away from what we want it to be. And uh, we, we kind of compare our input with our output to see how, how similar is it, how far off are we. And, um, and the magic part, at least for me, coming, not coming from that field, the magic part is you can basically run the machine backwards. So, you can see, okay, which slider actually had a positive influence on the output. So, which slider had a, a like a, an influence that 
brings us closer to our goal, but backwards. So that is the, that is the, the, the concept that is a bit tricky to, to uh, explain. But, but do you roughly get what, I, what I'm saying? Yeah? So you can basically run it backwards and see, okay, if I would have done that more, then I would have been closer at the end. And we, we basically record all these movements so we can see, okay, which one has actually a, a, a big influence on, on the image, or in our case, an image, and which, which one brings us closer to our goal. And then we do that again and again and again, and always compare, because that's our method of seeing how, uh, how close are we actually to our output that we want, right? And there's different uh, functions to, uh, to kind of compare images. There is uh, the mean squared error. There is a, a, simil a similarity. Um, uh, what is it called again? Now I've lost it. No, no, but, but, but the point is, what you want to measure is just the difference between the image that you're generating yeah. and the, if, uh, the, the image that and you the, wish. And you can do that in different ways, right? You can, you can either see for an image, for example, you can average the whole image and then compare it, like uh, literally the numbers. So we all know there's pixels, there's, uh, there, uh, there's colors. And you can also do it structural, where you have like uh, the luminosity, uh, the contrast, and all this stuff, and go compare that. Um, but, but I don't know, it, it's not important how that in detail works, but it, the, the, the main concept here is that we can compare it. Like, we know, okay, we are far off or we are closer, right? That's, um, that's mainly what we want to achieve in the end. And we do that as long as we have to, but we do it in like little steps. So we can't just pull the sliders up in the direction because then we would at one point go over the top and go away from the image again. So we would be really close and then we would go too far and then we would be at the other end again where, where it's far off again. And so it, let me sum this up maybe as a, all yeah. your tangents compress it again. So uh, what we need is a uh, machine that generates from an input some output, some sort of being able to compare the output we generated with what we want, and a method of finding out which sliders in a machine to adjust so the output gets closer to what we want. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> That, that's, yeah, that's mainly what I wanted to see. Yeah, that's the, that's the tangent problem. That's the tangent thing. <laughs> Welcome to my world. Yeah. Um, yeah, but good that you're here because then uh, people understand me a little bit at least. Yeah, I just want to see what you have down there. So that's, I'm just like, yeah, you know. Yeah, so before, before I start with the, with the, with the code, code stuff, um, there's one concept that is in there that I didn't talk about and that, that is very, uh, very important here. And the, the concept is called gradient descent. And that's basically... Who ha heard that? The gradient descent, ever heard that? Okay. Yeah, Sorry. the people that obviously de dove deeper than... Yeah. I mean, it's right when you go through the door, it's the first thing you, you probably encounter. So it's, uh, it, it's for the others, it's, it's, uh, if you, you can imagine you're like at the top of a mountain and you want to go down into the valley, but your eyes are closed. So or, you don't or know. There's fog. There's really or there's thick fog. fog. Now your eyes are closed, good, it's more dramatic now. <laughs> okay. So okay. You, your eyes are closed. But because your mountain, it, it's your also eyes important okay, okay, because yeah. then if your eyes are closed, you like go like tiny steps. Because yeah. you know, if you go big steps, that could be it yeah. for you. Yeah. So and you try to go down the steepest slope because you're reckless. Yeah, right? of course. And you 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 want to go down as fast, fast as yeah. possible, right? Yeah. So the way you do that is like tiny steps and then you go another tiny step and another tiny step. Because if you would go big steps, first of all, you could fall, right? And also you don't know where the valley is, right? You could go yeah. up again. Yeah, you could on step the over the valley. Yeah. And that's exactly what happens if, if, you, if you go too big of steps, then you, you, just, you either fall. Or you overshoot. Yeah, or, or you overshoot, right? And that's what we don't want. And that step is actually called the learning rate. If, if people are like dove into it, you know, it's like the... The step the, length. The step, like how do you wiggle the sliders? How far do you wiggle the sliders, right? That's, that's the learning rate. And that's basically the tiny step to not, you know, get lost or go over the top, right? 
That's did that is that good? Yeah, <laughs> people got that. Yeah, good. Yeah. <laughs> so and it does get more abstract now. <laughs> so, that's the problem with that stuff. It isn't really, it isn't really easy to to explain. But I will try my best. So now we know. Okay, how can we train like on a very low level? How can we train? A network. How can it learn to kind of translate, so to say, one thing to the other? Um, but that's yeah. It's 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 really just the basic concept of it, right? But what is important here is that you have to find a way to represent your data so the the the, the network can understand it, right? And in 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 if you if you are really changing from a from a image to a text, you have to kind of come up with a way to get from an image to a text, which if you translate it into numbers, which is basically how this whole thing works, an image is basically a huge uh, array, which like has uh, three by whatever resolution you have, 512 by 512, uh, floating point numbers in in that case if you if you work with these uh, models so you have to go from that matrix to a text right and that is isn't obvious <laughs> how you how you do that probably for for uh, for most of us and um, I'm probably not going to talk about it in like like in depth but I'm trying to just paint the overall picture. paint the picture so um, how we do that is we basically, in the model, go through filters to break down the image. So um, we have, like, we start in a, like a huge multi-dimensional space, and you then you sent me that demo, right? That, uh, that online demo. Oh yeah, that's good. See, I forgot about that. <laughs> One second. And also, you, you had you had gradient descent illustrated there, man. Oh yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> well, that. <laughs> That is the tiny, like the tiny point is the person that does the tiny steps, and then it goes from, you know, from there down into the water, and that's probably where you want to end up in the water. <laughs> so we'll end Which is anyways. a good thing in that. In that. Sorry, I'm scrolling through this because. Um, So what we see here in black are the layers. Here's the input, and it goes through the layers. And this one, the last one, is called the the, the fully fully connected layer, which <laughs> doesn't say much probably for you, but it's basically where it ends up. So if I draw a number here, then you see how it got. This is a, a, a convolutional network, so it, it basically breaks the input down. Uh, through filters, so basically, uh, you also know, like uh, you all know, like edge detection or Gaussian is, blur is typically a implemented yeah, as a blur, convolution the, curl. Like it, is, it is a filter, yeah. basically. So it, it extracts features from uh, from my input, basically, and then breaks it down uh, through something that is called max max pooling, which is basically taking the, 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 the most prominent, let's say, most prominent feature and preserves it, right? So the, the most important thing, as you can see here, it learns, okay, if it's a seven, it's, it's quite sure it's a seven, it could also be like, if, if I do this, then it gets it's a two, right? Because you, have ed you, you see the edges, right? It, it kind of gets the image because it breaks it down into parts. Let me interrupt you there. I think another way of um, talking, uh, of uh, seeing this, is like a sort of compression, but a compression by features. So each yeah. of those convolution thingies is a filter that's adapted to either find um, slanted edges or straight edges, uh, and that's what you see in those activations. So when they up there get um, really colorful, it found um, edge exactly. x y, and down there you can actually see in the lower lower half you can see what the filter looks like. It's really not very telling. It's yeah. It's just what the network cooked up to be able to analyze certain features yeah, within and, the images. Yeah, and then it gets up 
and, and it compresses gets, and, and compresses the data further, further, further until exactly. we arrive at a single digit between zero and nine. Okay, and then you can see how these these points here, like the the the, the bright ones, are activated. So you can see who activates what. But it, it, obviously that's a bit out of scope here. But you you get that it basically breaks down the image into features that are. Uh, uh, in a smaller dimension, basically. Shall we get back to the language thing <laughs> and the text? Yeah, the language, the language thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, sorry, that all that scrolling. Okay, but th this is just to to give you an idea how you can how you can translate something that has a much higher di dimension to something that has a lower dimension, right? That this is, because that is a big, that is the big problem, right? That, that is there's, what we... There's one theory that you actually brought up that says that uh, machine learning as well as human cognition is, uh, could yeah, be viewed as a, compression. There's a, there's a, it's a theory, so it isn't proven, it, but I find it like, just as a, a thing to think about, it's interesting that uh, compression is a bit like intelligence. If you that's a big sentence. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's just a theory. I'm not saying this is what it is, but but that's a huge sentence actually to say. I shouldn't say that. But you, it's just to explain it. If if you can condense information to the essence, right, then you have a much better overview. But there is a danger that you get the wrong essence, right? So that is important. But just to uh, to um, to make a point, it's like uh, the, the compression idea is it kind of makes connections between things and then sorts them into piles for you to, so you, you know quicker, okay, this is there, this is there, this is, if you tidy up your room, you find stuff quicker, right? That's basically compression. So it basically sorts, in this case, images yeah. by what it finds within the images. So it because piles a lot apples, of it piles oranges, and not necessarily does it pile um, fruits in the same cluster. So it could, for example, pile a fruit with, I don't know, uh, an object, a vase or something. So yeah. um, it compresses in a way that makes sense to the network itself, not necessarily how we as humans would cluster yeah. or compress this information. Exactly. How do we get from that to the language? To the language. Or to the text input. The, the text input, yeah, yeah. yeah that, but, but there's one thing before that. No, <laughs> jeez. Because otherwise, yeah, it's getting a bit. Well, no, let's go there. Let's go there. <laughs> oh fuck it. Um, oh, yeah, I can't. So, um, yeah, how how do we get the text input in there, right? Yeah. Like, maybe I should uh, explain the architecture of. St I, I take stable diffusion here as a as a as a um, as an example, so uh, what sta how stable diffusion works is actually it's not one model, it's like three of them. So it has an autoencoder, it has a unit, and it has a text encoder or a transformer. And the, the transformer is where the magic happens in terms of text input, right? So a again, the same problem, we get text in, we have images, how do we combine the two? How does this work, right? And to show that, maybe, I uh, will just quickly, no, maybe I talk about it first. Um, so to do that, you have to, you have to make a bunch of multiplications. I don't know how deep. Let's not go deep. Yeah, okay. So. <laughs> It's basically, it's basically a lot of reprojection, and uh, reprojection is probably also. It's 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 a bunch of math that sounds more scary than it is under the hood. And yeah, really, it sounds it's, scary, it's and it isn't really scary if you know what you're doing, yeah. like everything basically. But <laughs> but it 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 can uh, it what it can do, which is the important part. What it can do is, it gets us from one space into the other. Yeah. But if you work in 3D, there's texture space, there's world space. Right, you, UV whatever space, UV yeah. space, yeah, you have space. all these. Well, UVs are probably quite nice because it's like a three D, three dimensional space that get, gets mapped onto a two dimensional space, which is basically what you do a little bit with uh, images. 
Mm -hmm. Because the tokens, which is a text, or the token embeddings, which is the vector, basically, that, uh, that makes up the text or the token, is uh, a different dimension than we have with the image, and we have to reproject one thing into the other. So basically, what you're mentioning here, and what we didn't explicitly tell you, is that the two steps we need in order to have stable diffusion running is train it and tell the neural network that A, this is how you encode an image, means compressing an image into what we call latent space, which is... <sighs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to talk about that. Are you going to go there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. In two hours. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to do the same thing for the text. So you have yeah. to transform the text into another space and yeah. the images into other spaces to yeah. do the kind of stuff that we want to do to it mathematically. E exactly. So basically, it's all translation, right? You have to translate it to kind of see, okay, because the, the, main, the main objective is for the text to see what in the image is actually important for that word. So which word has what influence on what which? part of the image, which pixel, let's say, gets activated at... Cat. <laughs> yeah, cat, exactly. A cat, if you have a cat, like the word cat, basically I have a little, um, I have a little visual here somewhere. Shall I look, uh, look it up for you while you talk? Yeah. That's I'll, I'll, I'll do the scrolling, you do the talking. I feel like a little old man. Ah, you know. <laughs> so getting, getting ready for professorship, you know. Yeah, there, there, there you, you go. go. So you basically, what happens is that, but this is, this is after the translation. So after the translation, the, so we do, we get the image in, we get the text in, bunch of math happens. And we go back to the original uh, dimensions, and what we have is a weight matrix on, on top of this. And then we see, okay, which pixel pays attention, and that's the word, like, because this is called cross-attention. So you basically go, like the, the image or each pixel knows, okay, this is important for me, this is important for me, this is important for that word, and it, it kind of focuses on that you link, you, basically, you link certain words to a region in the image. Exactly. And that is the heat map there. This is probably dark, the way it looks. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah, you never know. Well, well they, they are not always right, and that is also a problem at one point. But uh, let's just say they are in this, in this um, example. So, there you see, basically, what we succeeded in is we mapped our information that is in the text onto the image, right? And the image is not, which is important, the image that we feed in is not a fully formed image, but a noisy image. Because it all starts from noise in uh, instable diffusion and uh, the diffusion models in general, right? So the way the fusion models work, what you could think about it, the unit that you see in this, uh, this animated graph that we have down here, this one. So what this thing is doing, um, it is there to stepwise get rid of noise in an image, just like your standard denoiser that you know from post-production. But it does so in a controlled way. Um, that's why we've been rambling on about how you map those words onto images, because this mapping, in a way, is used to control how these individual blocks denoise a certain image in order to denoise it into a cat, to denoise it into a human, to denoise it into a spaceship or whatever you can imagine. Yeah. And so it does so process. with like the filters we saw earlier, the convolution filters. Well, it's not only convolution, it's also the cross attention that happens on every layer. This is a layer. Like the, the blocks here, these are layers. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Good. That's good. So these are layers. So at every layer, there is a lot of stuff happening. Um, it's a very simplified block diagram. So it's the very, internals, yeah, of course, it looks very internally, simple. Internally, there's lots of more happening. Yeah. So in, in actually, in every of these modules or blocks, there's a lot of these filters happening. There's also the attention or the cross-attention happening. And it, it gets broken down to smaller and smaller um, dimensions. See, like this is the last layer. Oops. Oh, you can turn it. Wow. That's crazy. <laughs> So this, uh, this is the last layer, right? So it, it breaks it down to smaller and smaller uh, dimensions, really. And, and one very important part here is the connections that go from 
directly from block to block are called skip connections. And what they do is a bit like the game. What was the English, English name? It, there was one problematic name, and there was telephone, I think. Yeah, it's called Chinese Whisper, which is... I don't know if that's cool to say, <laughs> but there's also other, other names for it. In it's, Germany, in German, it's, it's still a post. post. So basically, people... Get in a line. Get in a line, and someone tells someone something, and then it goes through the line, right? And at the end, it usually doesn't... It isn't usually the same as it went in. I don't know, what is the English... Do you know this game? Any native speakers? Broken telephone. Broken telephone. That, that sounds good. That's yeah. Broken telephone is also yeah. That that fits. So if you if you if you play that game, you usually get something completely different out at the other end. But you have to imagine these connections, the skip connections, to work like the first person in the line could go to the last person in the line and tell them the word. So it would get the whole information across all of these layers. In addition to what it hallucinated. In addition to what it learned on the way, or the, 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 the layers on the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's complex. That's a bit abstract. But do you roughly know what I'm talking about? Yeah? Sh sh should I do, try to do a quick recap? <laughs> yeah, maybe you do a recap and I drink. You, you drink, okay. Um, so basically, we're feeding image data here. Think of it just as image data, which is first noisy and at the end should produce an image. And we're doing it through this broken telephone method. And you could see that between each block, that it be, uh, means between each participant, we lose information. We have less information, less information, less information. And at the end, we try to come up with the image that we whispered in the first beginning and want to have that out in the same thing with everything we have in between. So in your head, you might imagine one says pizza, and you hear big sack. I don't know. So you have this big sack. Uh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> this information, but at the end, you go to the person and say, it was pizza. So you can mangle those two informations, one that you dreamt up yeah. and one that you have together. So the skip connection is there to preserve detail. Yeah. Yeah. Because it gets, like, the, the important part is it, it gets omitted because, like we saw on the attention maps, the the pixels concentrate on one part of the image. And if we wouldn't have the skip connections, we would also have to have self-attention. So every pixel would also have to attend to itself a lot to preserve the information, right? And that, to kind of not have that problem, we have the skip connection. What do you mean by each pixel has to attend itself? Yeah, that's another thing, right? <laughs> yeah, so basically the image, like, uh, because it only, it only, let's say, the information flows only here in the map, there's nothing happening on the, on the other side of the image, right? So it only where it... Scroll, scroll there. So only where the blue stuff, is, there's not much happening, right? And we would lose a lot of information in that part. Because not a lot of information is flowing there. So these skip connections are a way to get that information back in. For the blue parts that are not encoded in that yeah. single word. Let's, let's leave it at that. Yeah, we leave it. But you, did you get roughly why we do that? Okay. I mean, it, there's much more to it, of course, but... Um, just maybe uh, as a little... So these, basically these blocks that you he see here, these are the blocks. Let's see here. Yeah, you see one block, right? So that basically... Oh, um, there's more actually. But yeah, let's, let's just... The attention is basically this part here. That's, that confuses you even more probably, right? Yeah, but yeah, I'm just, I just wanted to show it. Like in, in, in they're basically so you just see there's, hap there's more happening than one thing, right? It goes through all this, these layers, like Photoshop layers. A lot of stuff happens stacked, yeah. basically, right? Okay. But a, a, a main part is now if you if you think about it, an image. If you think about an image that has like, fucking hell, this is so long. <laughs> so, um, an image, if you think about it, um, has a lot of 
numbers in there. If you think about three, even if like a 512 by 512 image, which for you is like a stamp probably at this point, it has a lot of information. It's like three channels times 512 times 512. And it's as if you think about calculating this whole stuff we've been talking about, with that amount of numbers, it's quite a lot. It would take ages. It would take ages. So there, there's a trick in stable diffusion, which is also why it's called latent diffusion. And that trick is another model, which is called the, uh, an autoencoder or a variational autoencoder, which is a little bit different, but you know, we leave that out. Um, what, what it does basically is compression again. It, it learns to feed an image through and get the same in, image out on the other end. Then you're like, okay, why, why are you doing that? You feed in one image and get the other image out and you have to do that for like days. Why are you doing that? The trick is in the middle, you have like a tiny portion of the image which has all the information that the image has but in a much smaller space which so if we look at this image, this is an image, and this is the latent, oh, sorry, I have to encode it first, of course. Oops, this one, sorry, sorry. Maybe. So what, what, what happens now is it, it, basically I, the image runs through through the model, and gets compressed, right? And also, I added noise to this because this is what Moritz said in, in stable diffusion is basically um, it learns, it gets it over in, in the training, it gets like an image, and the image gets gradually more noisy and it learns to basically reverse that process, right? But it doesn't do that on, on the, in the pixel space, it does it in the latent space, which is basically what the autoencoder helps us with. So it gets comp uh, compressed into, the, yeah, this is, the, even this is a lot of numbers. You can't even, like, they are not all in here. And this is already the small, the small one, right? And what we get out of it is, like, we get four channels, not three, like, not RGB, but four with like 64 by 64, so it's a lot of information, like a lot smaller than it was before, but it doesn't lose any information, or little probably information. a little bit, but you can't see it with the naked eye. So if I get it out of that space again, it the image looks the same. Yeah, virtually right? the same. I mean, you could do pixel difference and you would have slight difference, but... There, there probably is a difference, but it is a very good compression, right? And Every computer, like the whole computational part of it, stable diffusion happens in that space, in that in the much smaller latent space, right? So latent space basically is just another representation of the data you feed into a neural net. Yes, yeah, that's, that's what latent space is and means. Exactly. It's. Um, let me go there. So. The late, yeah, the latent spin. That, that, that is actually my favorite, uh, my favorite uh, concept of this whole, uh, of this whole, uh, let's say, technique. Is you have to imagine the latent space. We have a 3D space where we go like x, y, z, right? Which is what we call three dimensions, right? But we are actually looking. If you think about it, we are looking. Even if we are looking at a flat image, we are looking at a multidimensional image because we are if you want to describe it you could say okay it's x y and then you have three numbers for the color right that's another vector that's another dimension or three so, dimensions yeah, really. five, yeah so in, in our, yeah, five yeah at yeah. all you end up with five dimensions but now you have dimension. to imagine much more of that right like a, a bigger bigger space but in this space through the learning we basically build a distribution, so the, we kind of, let's say, sort the... Yeah, again, the we, cluster, we cluster stuff, we cluster. like I mentioned, with the, with the fruit and with the vase, and we cluster that in your space. And think yeah. of that for, for, for 
Beginner's sake, um, I, th I think I find it helpful to think about latent space as a three-dimensional space that you travel. And you just got points for your fruit, you've got points for your humans, for your animals, for your cats, for your spaceship, whatever. Yeah, but it isn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> but the, the, so the, the main thing, what maybe, maybe what inter is interesting is, is if, if you take, for example, an apple, and it is described in that space, and then you, you could subtract sweet and red, then you would be in another space, because that's a direction, and you would maybe end up as a lemon, right? That's how this space works. So it's basically directions, but much richer. It's not like, oh, I'm going here, and then I'm going there, le left, right, up, down. It's more... Semantic. Yeah, semantic. Is, is that a word? Yeah. Semantic. Semantic. That word. So that's basically the interesting part is, for me at least, I, I kind of imagine it like you all probably know these sculptures where they only make sense from one side, and if you look at the other side, it kind of doesn't make sense. So if you, if you, if you look at the, the latent space, when you train it, you basically start at the mountain and you go into the sea, and the sea is noise. And the mountain is a valid image, like an image you can actually see, right? Or it makes sense to you, let's say that, like a valid image. I don't know what to say, yeah. like cat, a cat or a dog or whatever. And if you want to generate images, you basically go up the mountain, and the peaks are valid images. And if you go from peak to peak, in the middle there's probably some garbage, and then... Uh, so water again, not garbage, water, hopefully not garbage, and then water, and then you add, you, you add an, another peak, and it's another image, right? And your guide is basically the text in our, or any conditioning, like... I'll some, be talking about those. Yeah, he's, he's going to do that. Um, so they are basically your guide, right? And then for everyone that, um, that used stable diffusion, you have different samplers, do you know, da, does anyone? The sampler is basically your boat, right? It's basically how do you get from the noisy water up the hill. And there's different ways to get there, right? You can like slowly walk there. Some people are a bit more reckless, they jump, right? And stuff Some like that. That's what pack. samplers do, it's like clever math tricks to get from the noise back up to the image, yeah. right? And that's the latent space if you break it down to, again, a three-dimensional space, which isn't really doing it justice. But, you know, and that's, that, that's the, the main part that I find interesting is, like, you basically make sense of the world or our perceived, and there is the problem, our perceived world, so every, the, the, the world that you, you built there, it's very much dependent on the data you feed it, right? And that's the problem then. Because the data you feed it, if you try to make the everything world, it's quite hard to balance it. Because you will always have a bias towards anything. Like, even if you don't know it. Like, we probably also, if we interact, we have that. Absolutely. And that is the big problem, right? So as fascinating as this whole world is, it's very hard to actually balance it. So it is a representation. It is a fair, let's say, representation. I don't know what to say. Because it's still... And that, and that is a bit... The problem is it is it's get, getting sold as the everything machine, but it isn't. Because not yet. At least, right? Because it, it, me, it, yeah. it's very hard to like balance this whole world that it isn't like... I mean, I mean the machine learns from the samples you feed it. And everyone exactly. has heard about these biases that's in there. For example, when you type criminal, like a surprisingly huge amount of time you get people of color. Yeah, or there's this, there is this like an, an, an old one where you, you have like uh, medical imaging where they try to find out like... Um, if they can train like a model on images of uh, birthmarks and to see is, is there growth, right? And all these images, often doctors have like a 
a ruler next to the birthmark if there's like a just there, there's something that like okay yeah we have to check if that looks a bit bigger then we, we kind of have to check it and then they fed all that data into the model and the model learned okay every time there's a ruler next to it it's cancer that then that means that that's cancer so to say but it isn't true because it's not always true and then you see how dangerous that can be and how wrong that could go right if if you're not careful balancing the data so as fascinating the whole technology is and how these models work the most important thing in the end is what goes in because what goes in comes out right and there's there's obviously <laughs> there's a lot of problems yeah there's lots of problematic uh, things in those data sets yeah because um, yeah, a lot of uh, data sets are like if they are scraped from the internet. You all been on the internet, uh, <laughs> you know. If you scrape that stuff and it, it's captioned images, they are not really. There's not uh, like it's not always that there is like a, a person sitting there and like consciously caption that image, right? If if there's a lot of people on uh, whatever uh, Reddit or. Uh, something like that, find it funny to caption apples with uh, uh, cherries. And if you have that in your data, then you're basically getting cherries if you want apples, right? So, and that is a very obviously, <laughs> there's bigger problems than that, but you know, just to make it, make it, uh, make it apparent that the, it is very, uh, oh, very important. It's basically the programming happens with the data. Yeah. You program the machine with the data. So, what it learns, it can give back, right? Or in, in mixed form. Not hopefully not like just back, but in mixed form. But um, yeah, that's a very important point, right? So that is um, maybe the most important point. Actually. <laughs> so yeah, that and we probably have to deal with that over the next year <laughs> a lot. Um, but maybe that's why it's also good to understand it, right? This thing can only work with what it gets given, right? And it finds patterns where we don't see them, at least not immediately. Maybe after it found them, we also can, or then it's like, oh yeah, the ruler. Ah oh, yeah, that was a bit stupid yeah. to have that next to it. But because it's so new, you kind of, you have to learn how does this, work how how does it learn how does it learn exactly um so is that did that make sense with the da data stuff good that's good where in your stream of consciousness are we yeah <laughs> um i don't know myself but i hope i hope this is still fun it's it's quite hard to you know condense this stuff but uh, i just want to I hope I can get the most important stuff across. Um, so we have the data. We had, like, how do we get from a text to an image? And how does this latent space work? Are there questions to how does this work together? Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a good point actually. That's so did yeah, sorry. If it's only if it's did you all get what he said? Okay. So if it if it if the data is own if you only have the like if the monkey for some strange reason always has a banana on his head where in his hand or on his head? On his hand, yeah. So he the monkey is like this for for some strange reason in the whole data set. It it you can get it on the hand uh, on the head, sorry, probably. Because it knows 
the concept of hand on head and banana, right? Yeah, so you would have in the heat map, you would have like a hot thing for the banana up on the head. And this whole, like the heat map only can obviously display one word, right? So you have the banana, if you would put in, show me the attention map, which is what it is called. For the banana, it would be hot here. For the head, probably here. And then, then you go like this, right? And the monkey, it already know, But obviously, it needs to have seen some kind of being having the hand on the head, right? Because otherwise, you, there's no concept for this. If the whole data is a banana monkey with a banana in the hand, that's the only thing you get out of it because it doesn't know the connection, right? Your latent space is empty, but you have one pile with banana monkey hand, right? If, if you only feed that in, right? There's another one. Well, if, it, if you only tell it a monkey, so again, if you only pit, put the data for a monkey in, and it has never seen a, a banana, or it has seen a banana, but someone put, funnily put the caption but apple on it, it won't know what a banana is, right? It, it, it doesn't get the, the concept of it. Yeah. Yeah. So, again? Ah, you want to in-paint it? Yeah. So if if what you what just I repeat it so I know what you maybe uh, hopefully I got it so you upload an image which you basically you can feed like a, as a starting point you can feed images in right and what you say is is that image that you feed in gonna be also there for everyone else no because you have to train that stuff right the image it just happens uh, in that moment as a so usually which usually these, these, the process, right, with the text-to-image starts at noise, right? In your case, it would start at your image with a little bit of noise to give it room to work, right? And it will go from there and do whatever you want it to be. And for this, if you, for example, put a, 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 a picture of a dog in and you want the dog to have a hat on, Right, like in painting, it's called. Then these attention, these cross attention maps are quite important for that, because it also gets what is around this head that I want to put in there. Right, so the cross attention is very important to for for the whole image. So the ho every information flows through the whole image. It doesn't know only parts. It gets the whole image. So the connection, right, and that's uh, important. For example, for these if you want to change stuff, if you feed an image in and say, oh, yeah, this one should be uh, red or should have a... I'll be talking about controlling that and driving yeah, that with yeah, exactly. visual that clues in a second. Exactly. Um, I think we should wrap it up at this point. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> because no, it's yeah, I, I just want to give the people a, a, a few minutes of break and have a fresh air and come yeah. here with... Uh, if there are no attitude. questions, you can also... Um, exactly. You'll be around. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm around if you have hours of time to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the second part, um, I'll go over the practicalities of using that stuff in Houdini. Um, I brought slides. Um, it's not all purely Python code. I brought a bit of Python code as well. Um, yeah, so if you're interested in using this and driving this in a more visual way inside of Houdini and also outside of Houdini, be there in like five, ten minutes. Hope to see you then. Thank you. Thank you.